Hi, this is lecture three for Safety 43, Occupational Safety Management, and I believe it is fall 2020. I'm Professor Lusheen. I'd like to start out with a review of lecture two. Now, it, this is lecture three, so if you are watching this video and you haven't, you either didn't participate in lecture two or you haven't watched the video, please go back and do that. Um, and at, at the recording of this, I still have, I, tomorrow, basically, I'm going to record the week one review. And so I'll be providing you with some updates and tips on the weekly assignment, because just based on what people have submitted so far, it's not what I had asked for. Um, but again, we're going to use week one as an experiment. So as long as you turn something in, you'll get the points. Okay. So from lecture two, uh, the, the link will be here, um, right where the registration is. And um, here's the PowerPoint, the checklist. I'm not going to be providing checklists anymore. The first two lectures were kind of meant to be the demonstration. Uh, then I want you to look at these uh, three PDFs. Or I'm sorry, this is a link, two PDFs and a link. And then I went over these examples. And this was all about safety programs. Now let's quick, quickly just go over um, what we had, OK? So here on the screen, I've got the review slide. This is the final slide for lecture two. I wanted you to understand the purpose of a safety program. I uh, wanted you to know the elements of a successful safety program. That is something that we actually discussed in lecture one as well. I guess we discussed the purpose of a safety program too. What it's meant to do. What does safety mean? Uh, what does a safety program look like? Basically, it's, it's not the stuff that's, that's written down and put on a shelf or written in a program, but rather the living, breathing uh, what people do in order to protect themselves and their coworkers. What's the basis or source for a written program? It's, it's, it comes out of the audits. If you guys remember the functions of a safety professional, number one is to evaluate the workplace. And we could do that in multiple ways, whether it's visual hazard audit, such as what a compliance officer does, program review, interviews, behavior-based safety. There's so many different things we can do to understand what could harm people. Uh, coming up with an assessment technique to maybe prioritize or triage what we can get done first, getting management buy-in by showing the value in investing in safety and supporting uh, the safety program itself. Um, anything that isn't eliminated becomes part of the program. We can refer to the minimum level, the OSHA standards, just to know what we need to refer to, what needs to be documented, but then we should go above and beyond that. We should look to the industry best practices. And throughout the semester, we're going to be tapping into a lot of those things. Just like today, we're gonna to talk about some of that stuff. Uh, what's the safety professional's role in manager commitment, employee involvement, in engagement? We gotta to go to the workers and create uh, trusting relationships with them. We don't run up and ask them about safety. We don't run up and tell them what they're doing wrong. We want to find out what, they, what they're seeing, what they're feeling, what they're thinking. Then we can go to management and help them understand how their messages, their messaging, that's a better term, messaging, behavior, uh, are affecting the workers. And hopefully then we can bring the, the strategic and the tactical uh, language closer together. And then the metrics that are important, it's definitely not injuries. It's the things that lead to injuries. I like to you know, approach it from the perspective of what we can do to improve morale or having the workers take pride in their work and maybe even satisfaction in their work. Developing supportive relationships within the work environment. All these things uh, improve the overall workers feel towards what they do and will likely then improve their output or productivity. And then I talked about the stages of maturity, and that's just something that I came up with, that when somebody says, could you look at my safety program, and they're using the number of injuries or incidents rate as a measure of its performance, I know that it's, it's, it's in its very early stages. It's an immature program. More mature programs uh, better have a better balance of leading and lagging indicators. So uh, another thing that I want to show you is what kind of quizzes I used to give. So here is quiz for, uh, this is from lecture one. And hopefully at this point, you've already seen this because of the other lecture. So I talk about the general duty clause, the difference between compliance and value-driven approaches, the core elements of the successful safety program, which again came up in lecture two, and the basic idea of this con of this uh, model that I provided, which is another thing that, uh, I don't know if I can, I can't enlarge it, but you should remember this. If not, look it up. For the last lecture, which will be lecture two, Here's the quiz questions. What are the seven elements of a successful safety program? What does a program look like? How does it determine what, how do you determine what goes into a program or where do you begin? What is the safety person's role in management, commitment, employee involvement? 
And finally, what are the safety metrics? So the review slide tends to have the content that I had for quizzes. And uh, so hopefully you'll get that out and then um, I'll be able to share with you uh, what this one would have been. Uh, don't save. Okay. So I want to cover that and that. Let's open up. So here was lecture two. Lecture three. Uh, I will have a link to this recording, of course. Then we get the PowerPoint. I want you to go visit these links. Okay. I, we will look at them after the PowerPoint. And then these PDFs are just an option. And then I'm going to review these. Okay. We're already five minutes in. I'm way behind. That's what typically happens. Here's lecture three. I'm going to go through this fairly briefly because what I'm trying to do is just build a, a basis for the value driven uh, approach to safety. And it all goes back to quality management. So I want to spend more time on that. And then I'm going to at least introduce all these different resources that you can tap into or that a future employer may ask you to look up. All right, so let's talk about quality management. First, quality is what is desired. Um, and you have to be able to put a measure to it. If, if your quality measure is, well, they're happy, well, how can people's definitions of happy are going to change? So you need to have something more quantitative, something more objective that you can uh, work toward in order to ensure happiness in your customer. So quality management, therefore, is the effort to evaluate a service as you're delivering it or even after it's been delivered, um, but that's more lagging, or a product as you're building it versus you know after it's received. What are you going to do to make sure it meets certain marks? Uh, that's not a bad, good term. Certain um, objectives, measurable objectives throughout the process. So then when it is sold to the customer or when the service is completed or delivered to the customer, you're ensured that it's going to meet their requirements of what they expected because it was well laid out. Many times quality management is driven by data. Uh, if it's like a chemical process, they measure pressure and temperature, flow rates, uh, reaction times, things like that to ensure that the, uh, the final product meets certain criteria. When you're assembling a, a, a product, each step along the way, there may be a quality check to make sure that, you know, that uh, this, this one part is like this distance away or weighs this much or this takes this much torque. There's different things you can do to check it because if you don't do those things, if you go and invest a bunch of time to provide a service and then they don't like it, they're going to want their money back. And it also makes you look bad. So either you're going to lose money, you're going to look bad. For a product, you're just going to assemble it and send it out and some of them aren't going to work or it's not going to meet the quality or expectations of the customer. So they're going to return it because it's not good enough and then you're going to get bad reviews. So the idea is to minimize waste both in time and material and two, to ensure that uh, your product meets what you promise and that the customer will be satisfied and uh, give you a good review because then that'll kind of help you build your business. So statistical analysis is the basis of, of a lot of quality management, kind of the basis for the way I practice safety as well. In order to talk about quality management, in order to do statistical analysis, we should be talking about the scientific method, which is why I have this slide on here. And the scientific method is not a, a linear algebraic if-then uh, stepwise type process. It's, it's cyclical, but it's also, it can get messy at times. You got to just, you have to be systematic in how you're going through the process to better understand, to better improve, but there are going to be delays. And another thing is that when people think that, oh, you know, I'm adopting this quality management, that nothing can ever go wrong. That's incorrect. What you're doing is you're trying to build a system to detect the things that are going wrong before it becomes you know, serious or catastrophic. But more importantly, every time something doesn't work, something that doesn't occur the way you want it to, you're not going to blame a person. What you're going to do is find out what you can do to improve it. That's a really important point. That in safety, if we're practicing safety, that we're always blaming the worker. We're blaming the person who got hurt, the person most proximal to an accident. We're never really going to get to the root cause and try to improve it because they're going to feel some sort of feel that they're going to be uh, punished or they may feel they may get some sort of retribution. 
Uh, and so therefore they're going to try to hide things. And you can never fix something that's hidden. It stays hidden. Uh, and so I guess long story short, in order to practice proper quality management, you have to remove blame and you have to adopt a continuous improvement or in many ways in safety, a continuous learning uh, philosophy. I used to spend more time talking about the quality gurus. I wanted you to know who they were. Philip Crosby had a lot of commercial success and popularity. Popularity, Joseph Geron. Uh, I like his because he's the one who came up with the Pareto ratio, which you may know as the 80-20 rule. Um, vital few, trivial many. We'll, we'll use that uh, when we do the data analysis later in the semester. 80-20 rule. It'll come back. Sorry, I just hit my hand on the counter. Deming is who I like to talk about the most. He's my favorite. Deming is the father of total quality management. Uh, he has the plan, do, check, act continuous improvement cycle. And that's what I really want to get to because that is referred to in many of the um, the standards, like the ISO standards, OSAS standards, all these things, Z10, they have all, all adopted the plan, do, check, act, uh, uh, continuous improvement cycle. And that's what it's all about. It's that, okay, this is the way things are now. This is our assumptions. And we're going to measure these things to, and we expect this when it comes out. If there's any deviation in the process, well, we maybe take it out of the process and try to understand it and maybe we can fix it and then move it on. Um, preventative maintenance should be part of a continuous improvement, that we don't want anything to break down because that would be catastrophic to our production and what our production expectations are. And so it's doing something, it's it's like almost like, like experimentation in many ways. You you. You're planning to do something, or you do something, you assess it. If it met what you wanted, okay, good, and keep running, but always continuously monitor so that it, when something does fall out of tolerance, which is a statistical analysis uh, concept, we investigate and we try to then repair or correct what allowed something to get out of tolerance or get out of the, um, the numbers that we're shooting for. This was a figure that I created when I was doing some research in grad school. I was attempting to uh, mesh safety management and quality management. I wrote a paper on it and I just want to throw that in here. I did provide a copy of the paper. I do not expect you to read it. I actually don't want you to. It's too long. But realize that the elements here of quality management, safety management, there are a lot of similarities and that the outcomes, you can draw similarities as well. So in all intended purpose, it did look like this is something we could uh, intertwine. Now, I, the, my study was dedicated towards construction safety, and there was a lot more ambiguity and volatility in what they do, and so it, it, we had to think of it differently. I have here um, a manipulated work system model. And the, the idea of a work system model is that system deficiencies, when there is an imbalance, if you will, between worker capability and what's around them, whether it's expectations, social, technical, or task related, uh, when there's an imbalance there and they can't control for those uh, times in which things aren't the way you'd think they would be, then people tend to get hurt. That tends to result in, in injury. And so what I, what I have here on the screen is where you evaluate to be proactive and where you evaluate to be reactive. Too, too many um, companies seem to adopt just the reactive in which when someone gets hurt, we'll blame them, we'll try to fix them. But the thing is, what led to that person thinking what led the person perceiving this was the expectation or the person perceiving I got to get this done this way, that's what had them get hurt, not just them deciding I wanted to get hurt. They didn't do it on purpose. They didn't, they didn't want the, they didn't want to get injured. It was an unfortunate mishap. And what this figure is meant to say is we got to look upstream to the organization, the environment, the task, the technology and how they perceive it. And if we can correct that, then not only are we helping the person who got hurt in the first place, but anybody else who would be put in the same situation. They wouldn't then possibly ex be exposed to the same hazards or risks. The, um, when I was trained to do ISO 9000 back in the early 90s, I can basically summarize 40 hours versus worth of training to document what you do and then do what you document. 
That's what they want. So when the uh, evaluators come in or the auditors come in, they're looking at all of your paperwork and then they're going out to see if that's how it's done. And the idea is if you have the plan, do, check, act cycle built into your plans that when something is found to be out, again, either out of tolerance or not what you want, that there is a, there's an immediate response so that it doesn't you know, lead to um, a, a bad service or a bad product. Okay. Lean Six Sigma. Some people just call it lean. Some people call it just Six Sigma. The idea is you're breaking down an entire process um, to really understand, do we need to do everything that we just kind of thought we had to do? Or is there wasted steps? In the same regard, we may actually identify better measures or easier measures. So it's an efficiency perspective, but it's also making things more quality um, driven. And so that's really what it comes down to. And it's got all these things we can use um, to get into it. And then there's, a, there's quite a bit of, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, literature, study, videos that show how Lean Six Sigma techniques can be used to improve the overall organizational performance. It begins with breaking down the processes, but human resources can take advantage of certain principles. Engineering, purchasing, all every group could. Sorry, I, I don't like when these things come in one at a time. This, the, the idea here is just there's a lot of different things you can do. It's, it's sort of a stepwise process, but once it's built in place, it's meant to be self-corrective or self-driven. Continuous improvement. <laughs> and the different uh, levels within an organization will view it a little bit differently uh, because, again, I talked about this in lecture one, uh, management is thinking strategically. They're thinking down the road years. They're thinking of marketplace stuff. The worker and supervisor, on the other hand, are attempting to complete either a service or the uh, assembly or creation of a product. Two very different things. Now, their, their goals align ultimately, but you have to understand how they connect. And you have to then understand how the language, language is very different between the two. Um, and I think the safety professional is one of a few either individuals or departments within an organization that um, has responsibility at both levels. Okay. And so therefore they can help with that communication. 5S and 5S plus one. This is a, uh, came from uh, a Japanese uh, method of What's I mean, some people call it housekeeping. It's basically organization. And you can see they've got the different, uh, what the terms S, in Japanese, it's, a, it's different S words. Um, the idea being that you should be able to find something within 20 seconds uh, if asked to get it because you have like shadow boards, things are really well labeled, laid out, it's clean. Um, and the idea being when things are well organized, clean, you know where things are, there's less wasted time, you're using the right tools. Uh, it may give you better visual inspection of machinery uh, to make sure you know if there's a leak, you catch it before it becomes a real problem or something like that. It's just something that I think you need to be aware of. I'm going to talk a little bit about ANSI Z10, but it's really fallen to the wayside since ISO came out with the 31,000 standard. Or is it the 45? It's the 45,000, excuse me. The idea is they, they, they adopted the Deming PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act. Um, but the problem I had with it and I provided an article written uh, like 15 years ago by Fred Manuel. And we'll talk about Fred's work and some of the things he's done. We talk about Heinrich and Bird. Um, these are two researchers within our field that what they're saying on the left there is improve employee health and safety, productivity, satisfaction, image. I'm not sure that this approach would do those things, at least not at face value. I do agree that it will reduce hazards, risks, incidents, comp costs, and lost time. Because that's what it's designed to do. That's what drives it. These other things on the left come from something else. And that's something we're going to talk about in this class, especially in the next few lectures. So, um, yes, reduce the... You're, you're going to basically... Uh, another thing I think from uh, Deming, or maybe even Drucker was, what gets managed uh, gets attention. What gets attention gets managed. And yeah, that is Peter Drucker. 
Um, and that's the, uh, what's on the right. I don't think you would do these other things. The other things are more socially driven. Communication. Okay, so ISO 31000 is risk management. Um, that has a lot. It, it's similar to health and safety, but tends to mean more toward uh, the quantification of risk and then the management of it, and then therefore is more linked to insurance. The 45,001 is the occupant. So this one's brand new. This is what has overtaken Z10 and in many ways overtaken OSAS 18,001. Um, and I've got that on the screen there. So now a company that wants to be do international um, business will probably get ISO 9000, which is just pure quality. We'll probably get ISO 14,000, which is um, environmental, and then also the 45,000. For health and safety and the idea with this is that you document what you do do what you document then they have evaluators come in they assess that you are doing these things correctly you're collecting data that data is driving changes and improvements and then international you can do international business there are some countries they require all their contractors to be ISO certified OSAS is the old one it was predicated on older works it tends to all read the same though very similar language, very similar similar conditions. So if you go to a place that's OSAS 18001, it probably wouldn't be much effort to have them advance to an ISO 45001. Years ago, and I talked about this in, in lecture one, uh, Federal OSHA was looking to adopt an injury and illness prevention program standard, I2P2. Uh, but it's, 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 it's all but dead at this point. We'll see what happens if we get a new administration and a new OSHA head. But California has one, and these are the elements of it. They've got eight required elements, so you have to address the responsibility for the different elements of the program, how you're going to be compliant, uh, how things are going to be communicated, how hazard assessments are done, how acts investigations are conducted, and how that data is going to be used, how you're going to conduct and track hazard correction, how you're going to do your training, and then finally things alluding to record keeping. Um, and if you do these things, if you do these things well, and they're all kind of, they all fit together, you should have a more successful safety program because a lot of these elements I think you've seen from the other elements of the successful safety program we talked about. A simpler, much simpler, yeah, much maybe like the first iteration of the I2P2 was comes from uh, the Voluntary Protection Program, VPP. This is another OSHA product. It had picked up a lot of popularity um, between 2000 and 2010, and now it's kind of waning. But companies can still pursue this. Uh, it protects you. It doesn't protect you, but one advantage is it uh, keeps you off the list for wall-to-wall -wall, um, planned program inspections. You can still be inspected because of a complaint or a referral or a fatality or catastrophe, but um, it's, 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 it's a simplistic version of the ISO or the Z10 or the I2P2. And you can see the different uh, uh, items here on the screen. But what's interesting too is sustainability and safety has kind of lost steam as well. I really thought this was going to be, because in the environmental side of things really adopted the sustainability. From a safety perspective though, um, if we adopt that, we're not gonna consume anything that would, that would prevent future generations or availability to future generations. And um, you know, it, it's interesting. I, I'd, I'd have you just kind of take a look at this, just so you understand how it applied to workplace safety and health versus just environmental. So, got just one slide after this, and then I'm going to show you some of my other things. Um, there's a lot of options to choose from when it comes to which guideline or standard you'd want to pursue. Um, the most simplest, the easiest to, to obtain is the VPP. Um, it's based primarily on compliance. That's why. Um, as you start moving up the chain, and I would hold ISO... Uh, 45,001 is, is of the highest esteem, sort of the gold level. Uh, they adopt more of the quality management concepts. And I think that's a good thing. I think it's good to allow data to guide you on, you know, whether it's triaging what to do first or what's the value of the investment. Um, 
thinking more about measuring things that could lead to something bad, and so therefore you stop it from happening. I think that's good. And that's kind of what like behavioral-based safety was meant to do, but it kind of turned into a blame game. Um, let's see, what else do I want to talk about here? Oh, one size does not fit all. That's a very important point because some people think, oh, I'll just buy a safety management system. No, you build it from within. You build it based on what you have. You know, I, somebody builds a house one place. I really like that house. I'll just pick it up and put it on my land. No, it doesn't work that way. It has to be built into your lot. You know, the foundation has to be set based on what that lot has to offer. It has to meet the building codes of where you want it to be. You can't just buy it. You have to build it. Uh, my recommendation is let management choose what standard because if you choose it and it doesn't work the first time and likely it won't uh, because you make assumptions and you try things and then you, the idea is you're adopting a, an improvement process through learning and you're going to come up with better measures. You're going to use those measures to guide you. And if management doesn't understand that and they think that it's just a one shot, you get it, hey, we'll pass and then we'll be able to celebrate, everybody's going to be unhappy, essentially. Yeah. I'll let you look at this stuff. Let's go to the slides that I wanted to show you. Okay, so here's this. Here, oh, let me bring you to some of the links. Here's ASSP's Z10. What I'd want you to do for the summary is just go here and look and note that there are four different options. There's two podcasts and two uh, uh, professional safety journal articles that you could look at for Z10. And does it say what the most recent year is offhand? I, of course, I say it, and then I can't find it. See if you can find it. Next is a guide for Six Sigma. This is pretty good. Just to read a little bit more about it. See, I didn't talk about the belts. I did in class. Yellow, green, black, master black. What's the difference between them? So I want you to look through here. Oh, it talks about how much it costs. Yoinks. Lean and Six Sigma. Uh, this is an organization that provides training, and you can take a look at this. Maybe something you might want to add to your resume. Uh, it depends on how much you have to spend, I suppose. Here's a link to the ISO 45001. This will at least get you started. Again, I think this costs money as well, which is why you'd want management to choose it. And finally, VPPP, VPPPA, Volunteer Protection Program Participants Association, they hold an annual conference and they've got a lot of other information to help you with, again, which is probably the easiest way to um, pass a... Um, a safety management system. So that's all that. We looked at that. Let's take a quick look at something that I was asked to do. I was contacted and they said, hey, our company is thinking about VPP. What do you think of that? I said, well, you need an audit. And so they brought me in. Gosh, this is four years ago. It doesn't seem like four years ago. And I did a basic audit. And I'm going to share you with you what I had provided to them. So I prepared myself by understanding what a compliance officer would do should they go out to do a VPP audit. And I had been on a few before I left OSHA. Um, and I just tried to provide them everything they would need to know from, you know, who provides it. And it says here at the bottom, you know, you're exempt from the plan program inspections. Here are the basic principles of VPP. The different elements, so they, they break down the, the scoring worksheet into four, if you want to call it chapters. Uh, management, leadership, employee involvement are, are stuck together, work, work site analysis, prevention control, and then the training. This is how you go through to pursue the application process, how long it typically takes. I was only on site for, I think, two days, if that's correct. Uh, you can either be a star level or a merit level. Merit is lower, star is higher. And then the OSHA website, you can actually go there and look this stuff up. They, they provide evidence of why it's important. As you can see, the numbers did start dropping off after 10,000. I think it's probably dropped off even more. Based on the company's uh, North American Industrial Classification System, or code, I compared them to um, industry peers, and who had, you know, whether they were star or merit. And in Wisconsin, there are this many star sites. Okay, so the first thing you need to do is compare three years of incident rate data. 
the <laughs> the four areas that get evaluated, there are a total of 133 items under the four. Uh, this is really a modified Form 33 assessment form that I was actually trained how to use um, back in the mid 90s. So I had been familiar with it. The scoring system has changed slightly, but I adopted it. The idea being that um, if you can't assign a two or a three, if so, if you assign something a zero or a one, again, this is the 133 items, you OSHA has to tell you what you need to do in order to bring it up to a two or a three level. Here's their incidence rates. Uh, the uh, companies is blue and orange. And then the BLS comparison is yellow, a darker blue and a green. And so the company's three year total case incidence rate is 5.8. They're 15% greater than the industry. And their DART rate is actually 56% greater. So at this point in time, they could not even get merit level. They need to achieve a three year average below the industry average. So, you know, what would be you know, you'd want to look at your records, you'd want to look at your auditing and talk to workers, and then find w what is causing a majority, both from a frequency and a severity perspective, what's causing a majority of our work comp claims and OSHA recordables, and then attempt to mitigate that. And then over time, you know, you'd be able to achieve that three-year rolling average. So I got some subset section scores here, as you can see, both in planning, authority, uh, and system evaluation, they had ones. And so the opportunities for improvement, I'm actually um, referencing the line items here. And I'm not, I don't want to read all these things, so I'm already over 30 minutes. For worksite analysis, you know, wherever you see a zero or one, again, that's where the recommendations are going to come from. As you can see, I got two on the bottom. Same with this section. I had two recommendations under A. And then the final section, I didn't have any specific, uh, but I did make some overall um, recommendations. Talked a little bit about what they need to do, some of the things I found when I read between the lines. Almost 20% of the recordable cases are due to injuries with prior recordables. That's quite a few. When you have a repeat offender, it's like, what's going on? Here's their work comp data. Kind of broke this down for them. As far as you can see, the number of claims um, total amount of payments. I mean, the payments have actually gone down. So what's going on, right? I provided some input from management. Management was their biggest issue. Management is just completely detached from what their roles and responsibilities are for safety. And so until that gets fixed, it's going to be almost impossible to actually bring anything down. I'm just letting you know. Broke down some of the things I got from the employees as well. That was actually really insightful, what they shared. Provide some of the comments I got from my visual walk around and the pictures and then made my final recommendations. Making sure they understand, at least management understands that everybody needs to be part of this program for it to function. It can't just be the safety director doing all the heavy lifting because this is what happens out on the floor. Try to convince some of that. Here is just my report. And so this is something they can refer to. It's got more of the explanation and it's not as fun to look at, that's for sure. And so here's the OSHA uh, VPP assessment. So each one, I give it a score. I provided evidence um, and where, how, was it, how it was assessed. So it was time consuming. It took a long time to put this whole thing together. But this is what I use to generate my recommendations and to let them know what their current status is when it comes to pursuing VPP. And that's what you're gonna to have to do, is use some reference, whether it's from OSHA or from a um, industry best practice to convince management, this is the status, this is what's been happening here. Based on this, this is what we need to do. And that should help align safety with the more strategic goals of the company, which is kind of our ultimate goal. So I think that's all I had for this. Um, please go check out those links. Now, as you prepare your weekly summary, again, I want it to be a summary. I don't want to just see all the notes you just took. I want to see a summary of them. What did we really talk about and learn? There were some big picture concepts we had talked about. Um, we'll see how you do. Um, this week, we'll probably learn a little bit more we, than we did uh, the first week, so it was just one lecture. But I'm hoping you're going to look at the review slide and really understand what that means. and 
compare it to some of the things you had thought of before. See, in many ways, what you're doing is adopting a continuous improvement of your note taking and summaries. And that's what I meant. That's what I wanted this whole experience to be. I didn't want to bring it up until we talked about this. So sorry I went so long. 35 minutes is way too long, but um, email me if you have any questions.